chapter 14 on section 2, which is on page 32 of your booklet, and I just need to recall where we left off last week. I think we left off on footnote number five, if I'm not mistaken. If someone needs to correct me, then please correct me. But I think we finished number five and left off there. Does anyone object? No? Okay. Then I think that's where we're going to pick it up. So, I'll read through and then we'll pick up starting after that point. Chapter 14, section 2. By this faith, Christians believe to be true everything revealed in the Word, recognizing it as the authority of God Himself. They also perceive that the Word is more excellent than every other writing and everything else in the world, because it displays the glory of God in His attributes, the excellence of Christ in His nature and offices, and the power and fullness of the Holy Spirit in His activities and operations. So they are enabled to entrust their souls to the truth believed. They respond differently according to the content of each particular passage, obeying the commands, trembling at the threatenings, and embracing the promises of God for this life and the one to come. But the principal acts of saving faith focus directly on Christ, accepting, receiving, and resting upon Him alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. And so we did five last week, so we'll pick up after footnote five there, which says, because, and this is in reference to Scripture, because it displays the glory of God in His attributes, the excellence of Christ in His nature and offices, and the power and fullness of the Holy Spirit in His activities and operations. So they are enabled to entrust their souls to the truth believed. And on note six there, we have... 2 Timothy 1, verse 12, and who is willing to read that? Lisa. 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy 1, verses, well, just verse 12. Go ahead when you're ready. Amen. Who automatically goes into song when you read that verse? <laughs> yeah, I have to. Yeah. Okay. So there you have it. So this is Paul writing to his young pastoral student, talking about the trust. He's, you know, he's willing to suffer. He's not ashamed because he knows whom he has believed, and Christ will guard it until that day. Okay, and that's an important thing, and I think we're... We've seen that in other places, uh, but ultimately, the security of the believer is in whose hands? God's hands. I was told last week my peripheral vision is not very good, so I, <laughs> I'm going to scan a little bit more. Yeah, it's in God's hands, and uh, I would strongly agree with John MacArthur's succinct way of putting it uh, on this point, um, when he's asked, can a believer lose his salvation? MacArthur's answer is, if you could, you would. Right? If it was possible to lose your salvation, everyone in this room would make a hash of it. But perseverance in, uh, uh, in the faith is not your work. You're involved in it. It's you, it is you persevering, yes. But it's God's work in you seeing this work through to the end. Okay? It says here that I am convinced that he is able to guard it until that day. Okay? God guards your salvation. God, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, makes sure that you will persevere. Okay? So this isn't you just peddling harder, uh, hoping and, and white knuckling it, hoping you're going to make it across the finish line. This is God's sign and seal on you. The Holy Spirit is a seal of your salvation, ensuring you will cross the finish line. You will make it. You will make it, okay? So the, the reason we can have assurance is because God is sovereign. That's the basis of your assurance. God is sovereign, and he has promised to seal for eternity those who are his, okay? That's why we can have assurance. If salvation is a product of my choice, ultimately, okay? The reason Matt is saved is because Matt made a decision, 
which of course, in a very real sense, is true. Matt did make a decision, but it was one that was enabled by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. But if what is ultimately the decisive point of salvation is your will, if you could will yourself in to the covenant of grace, you can will yourself out. Now, if you can lose your salvation, can a believer have the assurance of his salvation? You cannot. You can't. You can say right now, if I would die right this minute, I, I can have assurance. But who knows what happens tomorrow? I, tomorrow I might choose to apostatize. Okay? In the Arminian conception, in the free will conception, assurance of salvation is actually impossible. You can have, and, and many will affirm, no, we do believe in assurance of salvation, but logically it, it doesn't work. You can't. You can, you can have the assurance that right this minute you're saved, but that's it. Tomorrow is anyone's guess. Tomorrow I may leave the faith. Tomorrow I may make a hash of my life. Okay? So actual assurance of salvation, which is a wonderful truth that was recovered at the Reformation, is grounded in the same theology as the rest of the Reformation. You can't hang on to the believer's assurance and drop all the Reformed theology that uh, supports it. Okay? This is a, it's a package deal. I trust him to see me through to the day. Uh, it's, it's in his hands, in his trust. Amen. Yep. Yeah, so Dave just brought us back a few verses to just underline and emphasize salvation is the operation of God, not of man. Keith, you had your hand up. That's right. If, so if perseverance is decisively in our hands, Keith is pointing out, and this is true, if the decisive point of salvation is in our hands, that means perseverance is our work. We keep ourselves in the faith by our working, by our willing. Which means, and every Arminian you know will deny this, but it's absolutely unavoidable. We're saved by works. You are, right? If you can lose your salvation through bad works, how do you keep your salvation? By good works. You cannot avoid that. This is, and this was explained to me, I, I think I've shared it here, when I was resting through these doctrines many years ago, God's grace was explained to me as an umbrella. If you move under the umbrella, if you're, and, and so faith gets redefined as being faithful, which should be a necessary consequence of faith. But as you act faithfully, you move yourself under the umbrella of God's protective grace. And as you act unfaithfully, you move yourself out of the umbrella of God's protective grace. It's all you. God's grace is there theoretically, but it's all you. Putting yourself in or taking yourself out. Um, and so, of course, one way to describe Reformed theology, the, the five points, is, is through the acronym TULIP, right? Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and then perseverance of the saints. John Gerstner teases Arminian theology is a daisy. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not, right? Because there's this constant moving in and out of being justified based on your performance. 
uh, and on your mustering up that faith. And again, that's not to deny the necessity of faithfulness and of obedient living, but we need to see that as a fruit of our justification, not as the hand that grabs onto our justification. But good works are not optional. They're, they're, they're grounded in God's, in this. So, so if it says here, I'm convinced that he is able to guard until that day that which has been entrusted to me. Okay, something has been entrusted to me, and so I still have a responsibility, right? Yeah, this doesn't absolve us of responsibility. It just shows us how, that, how we got there, who has put that in our, uh, in our lap. Anything else on this? Yep, okay, so Jeremy's pointing out that you have some people who are technically Arminian in their theology who believe in eternal security. And this is, so how do you get there? So you can will yourself in, but then you can't will yourself back out, Um, which seems like an odd thing, but there are some people who hold that view. Um, And that view comes from, so I think there's, there's a, a proper reckoning with the text of Scripture where it's so clear that uh, no one can snatch them out of my hand. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. You know, the, the chain of redemption in Romans 8, those whom uh, he predestined, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. Like, it's unavoidable. God ends up with the same group that he starts with. There aren't additions. There's not dropouts. God's chain of salvation is perfect. So they're reckoning with that, which is good, But I think when you hear once saved, always saved, you are dealing with a fundamentally different doctrine than perseverance of the saints, even though technically the understanding of perseverance of the saints that I would hold to technically would be once saved, always saved. You can't lose it. But typically when people talk about once saved, always saved, so now I'm thinking of people like Norman Geisler or uh, Charles Stanley held this view, it's basically without any reference to fruit in the believer's life. You went to camp and you had a meaningful experience at camp when you were six. You're saved. The Bible says you can't be unsaved. You never darken the hall of a church. You never live a fruitful Christian life. But you made that decision back there when you were six. So you're sealed for life. Um, and that's, that is exactly the view that prompted the whole lordship salvation controversy in the 80s. Um, yeah, and we could go more to the historical roots for how they got there. It's a product of a whole theological system that was popular at the time, but it's not healthy to just divorce the fruit from your perseverance. Your fruit is the evidence that God is working in you. So if I would, if I would see a Christian who is not bearing any fruit and is not concerned to bear fruit, but thinks they're saved because they went to a revival meeting 35 years ago and made a decision for Christ, I would basically have zero reason to believe they're a Christian. Okay? Because it's still decisionism. It's still, I made a decision, therefore. But if there's no, if there's no spiritual evidence in their life, why would, why would we assume the Spirit of God is there if there's no fruit? Um, anything else on this? Grant.
Yeah, and what Grant said should be a great assurance, but on the surface, that passage in Matthew, to me, is the most terrifying verses in the whole Bible. Because what you have in Matthew 7 is people who aren't hopeful that they're going to heaven when they die. You have a group of people who know with certainty that they're going to heaven when they die. And they die, and Jesus says, I never knew you. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think you're referencing Constantine when he lifted the persecution. Constantine's a complex figure in church history, and you'll find people what, that was good or bad for the church. And if you ask me, was that good or bad for the church, I'd say yes, absolutely, for sure. So, um, but on these verses here, these are people who are sure of their salvation, who go to hell when they die. And that's terrifying, but that needn't terrify us because look at what these people appeal to. Look closely what they answer. Not everyone who says to me, this is again Grant's passage here, uh, Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, this is the key here, did we... Look at me, God. Look at, look at all these things I did for you, God. Didn't I prophesy? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? Didn't I do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you, locker, you workers of lawlessness. Okay? Jesus isn't condemning them because they did good things. He says what they were doing was lawless. Jesus says, I hate that. I hated your prophecy. I hated your exorcisms. Okay? I hated your mighty works. I hated them all because it was a sham. Right? And so for me, the takeaway from this is, one, this is performance, emotive kind of Christianity, which we still have today. How many people would still give that answer? I learned how to speak in tongues at a workshop, Jesus. Right? I had a dream. I had a vision. When, when you face the Lord at your death, and he says, why should I let you into my heaven? If your answer starts with the word me or I, you are in bad shape. If you claim nothing but the blood of Jesus, you're in. These people are not claiming the blood of Jesus. They're claiming experiential overflow. Go ahead, Grant. Sorry. Yeah, amen. So, the, yeah, Jesus isn't saying, I'm not aware of the fact of you people. He's clearly aware of the fact of them. Um, and in Amos, God says uh, to Israel, you, you alone of all the nations of the world have I known. Well, was God not aware of the other nations? Well, no, clearly he was aware of all the nations, but he didn't know the other nations, right? Knowing, and this comes in when people will go in uh, the chain of redemption in Romans 8, and say, see, foreknown is the first word there. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. See, he saw your decision. He looked down the corridor of time. He saw your decision, and then on that basis, he predestined you. And that's not what knowing means in the Bible. It's intimate. When a man knows his wife, you can expect a baby to come later. It's that kind of very intimate knowing, right? So, so really in Romans 8, what you have is those whom I have foreloved, I predestined. It's not saying he saw passively, he's taking in information. I, I set my saving love on these people like a man knows his wife, and on that basis I, I predestined. And, and here Jesus says, I never knew you. And again, it's not that he didn't know the fact of them, but he did not know them in a saving way. And they were never Christians. These aren't people who were Christians and then dropped out. These were snakes from, from the beginning. The whole time they were doing their exorcisms, the whole time they were prophesying, they were snakes. And I can't help but think of Bethel. I can't help but think of Bill Johnson. I can't help but think of Kenneth Copeland and Joyce Meyer. I, 
there's our modern day prophets and, and demon slayers, and I have zero reason to believe, based on fruit, that any of them are saved. They're, they're deceivers. I often wonder that. Howard's just asking, do they think they're saved? I. I think so. I, I, self-deception is a thing, but I often wonder, okay, so you're Bill Johnson. You're running this big hustle in Redding, California, right? And all these young people are barking like dogs and healing, and they're super, na- and it's all, all a bunch of junk. Um, but you're this faith healer, and you wear glasses. And then your wife dies young of cancer. We have that right here in Winnipeg, a guy like that. Healthy, strong guy, dies 59 years old. Spend his whole ministry telling people that if you have enough faith, that won't happen to you. And then he dies at 59. What is, like, how many times do these people have to prove themselves to be absolutely false before we believe it? But I do wonder, does Bill Johnson go to bed every night hating what he just did and crying on his pillow and feeling bad but he just can't help himself? Or does he know this is a great way to become famous with the beautiful young things in Southern California and the money's pretty good too? I, I, think, it's the, I think it's the last one. But I don't know how people can deceive themselves but clearly... We can deceive ourselves. Anything? Yeah, Dave, and then... Well, it's the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, so it's a mixed, mixed crowd. And the law has changed, and I think this is something that we can easily be deceived. When we think of law-based Christianity, I think what we think of is the angry fundamentalism of the 1940s and 50s, right? Don't go to movie theaters, don't go to barber shops, don't go to pool halls, don't smoke a cigar, don't, you know, don't, 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 don't. Law preaching isn't quite like that anymore. Now law preaching is very happy and cheerful and positive. Do this. Do the short-term mission trip. Do, you, you do all these, do these random acts of kindness, and of course there's nothing wrong directly with any of those things, but it's positive, happy, clappy law preaching, but it's still ginning yourself up to do certain things uh, for your salvation, and, and we need to do things out of our salvation, not, not for them. There was a hand back there, and then we'll drive on again. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, that brings up another question. So Jeremy's saying, well, why wouldn't Jesus answer, no, you didn't? Can unregenerate people do things? I'm somewhat agnostic on that because the magicians in Pharaoh's court seem to do actual magic. It doesn't look like just sleight of hand. Is there such a thing as demonic lying signs and wonders? And I think there is. So I think Pharaoh's magicians actually, through dark power, I think they actually did do certain lesser magic. Can this happen? Uh, Probably. A lot of the magic is sleight of hand. So again, in the case of Bethel Church, um, a number of years ago, did you all see when they had the, the Holy Spirit descended with gold dust? It was so genuine, guys. Um, they were praying, they were, the music was rocking, all these beautiful young things full of hormones, thousands of them, and the Holy Spirit just showed up, and there was gold dust that came out of, it was so spiritual. Until one of the maintenance people got saved, left Bethel, and said, you know what my job was there? My job was to load the ducks with glitter and turn the blower on when the worship leader said the Holy Spirit showed up. Okay? That is satanic, but it's not satanic magic. That's just satanic manipulation. Anyone who's gifted with music and lights can drum up a bunch of hormonal teenagers and 22-year-olds into thinking all kinds of things that are not true are true. And there's mob mentality that takes over, which is why I think self-deception is actually a thing. But it's just lying signs and wonders. It might be manipulated signs and wonders where it's a sleight of hand, or it might be actual demonic things. I, I would leave the possibility open that it's both. And I think in a roundabout way, Jesus says that this isn't legit because he says, you workers of lawlessness, your prophecy was lawless. Your demon exorcism was lawless. Your good works were lawless. Everything you just did was satanic. It, it, it's from the dark one. It's from the pit. And so, in a roundabout way, whether this was sleight of hand or whether it was through dark spirits that they did certain things, either way, Jesus hates it because it's, it, it was sinful, whatever it was. So we, we just need to be aware. I think there's more than one possible explanation. Carter, your hand was up. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So Carter's just saying Jesus often assumes control of the situation by not answering the way people want to be answered. He just assumes the center and says, "I'm actually going to change the nature of this conversation because your question's a bad question." Right? That that can happen. Jesus Jesus frequently tells us you're asking the wrong questions. Uh, which, again, to make application, is actually one of the reasons I'm not a fan of too much topical preaching. Because topical preaching answers the questions that we are asking. Expository preaching, verse by verse, says you're asking the wrong questions. Here, I'm going to set the agenda by what's in the text. I'm not against any topical preaching. I think it, has it may have its place. But that itself, I think we need to keep in mind, if we're asking questions... The Bible reserves the right to tell us that's a bad question. I'm going to actually set the agenda here differently. And you'll, you'll get your answer, but you're going to get it on, on these terms, not on the terms that you're interested in right now. Let's, oh, Grant and then, oh, Lisa, let's go Lisa and then Grant and then we'll drive on here. Go ahead, Lisa. Right. Is 
it can be, probably. Lisa's asking about assurance and coming from the background uh, that, that they come from, where your salvation it comes through some kind of supernatural revealing, right? Um, and I wouldn't say that the Holy Spirit can't do that, but I will steal from John Piper here, where I think he says the greatest moments of assurance in his life have come when he's not looking for it, right? And that would match my experience. When I am looking inside my heart, there is, it's like this endless onion, and there's just always another layer of deception, right? Jonathan Edwards in his book, The Religious Affections, goes through that, okay? You love all this Reformation theology. You see your need for Christ. You see that you, you bring nothing. You see all this. You're, yeah, you're so humbled that you see your need for repentance. I've got it. And then you look and say, are you a little bit proud that you understand the gospel better than the Wesley brothers? Yep. Yep, I am. Well, there's another layer <laughs> of pride. Okay? Are you proud of the fact that you just recognized that last round of pride? Yeah, I guess I kind of, <laughs> I guess. If you're going to look for assurance that way, you never, ever, ever get to the bottom. There is, the heart is desperately wicked, it says in the Bible. We are so diseased that to look inside of us is not, I don't think that's the way. Should we be aware of what kind of fruit we're bearing? Yes, I think we should. But to look for assurance inside is exactly where the problem is. The problem is inside me. The solution is outside me in Jesus Christ. And so when people are struggling with assurance, and it is a real struggle, so it's, I think, a case-by-case basis, exactly the nature of someone's struggle. But for the most part, I would encourage, don't look inside look outside, right? You're reading your Bible and all of a sudden it just hits you and it's like, yes, Christ did this for me. Okay, but you're looking outside. You're not, I'm a morbidly introspective person so I know this is a dead end road. This is a cul-de-sac if I go in. I have to go out, okay? And I don't think it's, I hope it's not careless that I don't care about what kind of fruit I'm bearing. But You'll find assurance in the scripture. You will find assurance in everyday reminders, in God's providence. You'll find, uh, but you've got to look out. <laughs> look to Christ. Looking in here, Adam and Eve looked in here, and that's, the, follow your heart as the problem, right? F- follow Christ as the solution. And so, for the most part, I would say, just look at the promises of scripture. What does God say? Right? It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's a promise. Yes. <laughs> right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab onto that. Because that's something that's rock solid. Uh, what's happening in here is here one day and gone the next. Right? So I would encourage, look to Christ. Look in the scripture. Grab hold of the promises in scripture. That's the rock solid stuff. Your heart will lie to you 50 times a day. There was another. Kind of along the same line in regards to accepting this quote way back in Matthew 7 uh, in the song that she wrote, He is all the world is here, and he is not. And she kept pointing to these repetitive words there of uh, holy, holy, holy. And you just hear it like, Lord, Lord, I believe, I believe this is accepting this girl. I believe that we should not underestimate. Oh, I'm just going to stop you right there. Even the elect would be deceived if it were possible. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> the elect cannot be deceived, at least not finally.
I think it's a thing too, and that's why I say, you know, with the assurance struggles, I don't think there's a one size fits all because people are coming at assurance struggles from a different, from different places. But I think ultimately the final sense that someone's not saved is that they don't care. They, they, everyone, you see, and this, is, this was one of my big misconceptions about Reformed theology before I understood it properly, is I thought this process of election, the way I conceived of it, because that was explained to me this way, was that it's this cold, impersonal process that true, sweet, genuine believers will get to heaven and find out, yeah, you know, you were saved, you trusted in Jesus, but you're not elect, so, right? And then these godless people would show up, never having cared a thing about Christ, and there was this somehow impersonal elective force, and they find out when they should be going to the lake of fire. No, you were actually elect, right? You go to heaven. It was explained to me completely arbitrary, as though this made no difference in a person's life, which is just manifestly false. And I think, in my case, it was intentionally taught false to make sure you don't go down that road. Whether it was or wasn't, I don't know. But there is nothing threatening to God's sovereignty and salvation to say that 100% of people who want to be saved can and will be saved. If you want to be saved... There you go. If you want this, it's yours. And if it's not yours, you don't want it. Right? Like to just divorce this from the human heart is it's absolutely false. Everyone who wants to be saved has it. Unbelievers don't want to be saved. They just, they just don't care. By, by continuing to engage with them? Well, I think there is a time to quit engaging. Proverbs uh, 24, verse 4 and 5 says, speak, a, speak to a fool according to his folly, uh, lest he become wise in his own eyes. Don't answer a fool according to his folly, lest you become like him yourself. Within one verse, Solomon is rapidly shifting gears. So did he change his mind? And I'd say no. I think that's, it's a wisdom proverb. Know who you're dealing with, right? Um, Doug Wilson says, if you are going to go in and wrestle with a pig, you won't win, and the pig likes it. So you just move on at a certain point, right? Um, but not all cases are like that. Some people can be persuaded. So go another round with the person who's showing signs that he might be persuaded. But for the, especially the religious but lost types, they know they just don't care. They want to be respected in the community. They want some kind of ecclesiastical office. Maybe they enjoy the logic of theology and they're in the faculty of theology for the same reason someone's in the faculty of philosophy. It's just intellectual gamesmanship, right? Um, and that's what Paul means when he says that knowledge puffs up. A lot of people hear, oh, knowledge puffs up, so the less theology I know, the more spiritual I am. That's not what Paul's saying. That it, if Paul didn't want us to know theology, he wouldn't have written the New Testament. Right? Knowledge puffs up if it's divorced from the Holy Spirit of God. Right? But people who have the Spirit want that knowledge. They want, but they want that knowledge so they can live wisely and, and obey it. Some people just enjoy intellectual gamesmanship. They just like winning debates. Um, or they like, you know, I'm a rector in the Church of England, so I get, a, you know, I, I get to sit in the House of Lords. It, they're not saved. They just like the robes and the incense. Right? That, that can happen. Let's do one more point here. They respond differently according to the content of each particular passage. And then the first example here is obeying its commands, and that ties in nicely. John 14, 14, who wants to take that? Ron. Okay, there we go. What does that mean to ask anything in Jesus' name? To say, 
We ask in Jesus' name, that's a shorthand way of saying, pass the mashed potatoes, please, right? <laughs> that's just what you say before it's time to eat. In Jesus' name, right? When we say, when we end a prayer with asking something in Jesus' name, what are we saying? According to his will, right? According to his will, in Jesus' name, right? That, and Kenan's exactly right. It means according to his will. If you ask me anything in accord with my will, it will happen, okay? And that doesn't mean we shouldn't pray specifically, but we'll pray specifically, and sometimes God will say, nope, I'm going to do it this way. But if we're praying in accord with Jesus' will, we will get 100% of those things, right? So prayer isn't about twisting God's arm. Prayer is about being needy and moving ourselves into alignment with what God's will is. Okay? Prayer does not change God's mind. Prayer changes your attitude. Okay? Prayer changes you. God's will is set. God knows what he needs to do. God has all wisdom. You're not going to teach him something new. He's not going to pick up on a new tidbit or a new bit of information from your prayer. Uh, but your prayer makes you needy, it makes you soft, and it brings you alignment with what his will is. That's why we pray in Jesus' name, okay? So s- praying in Jesus' name is not just words that you say before it's time to eat. It, it should be a meaningful submission to the will of the Lord Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name. Jesus is our intermediary in heaven. It's through Jesus that we approach the throne of God. And so if Jesus says, yeah, that's really good, I'm going to take that to my Father, the Father gives to Jesus everything he asks, okay? So you're, you're in essence leaving your request with Jesus and he'll take it, say, leave it with me, I'll take it to the king, okay? Um, and it just so happens that in this arrangement, the son and the father are fully agreed. So if you're praying according to Jesus' will, that's the request he takes to the father and that's the way those, those answers come thundering back down to earth. That's what it means, okay? So think about that when you're praying. This isn't shorthand for it's time to eat. Really mean it. I'm praying this in the name of Jesus. Jesus will have to say, yeah, that is a good request. And then God will answer it. And if he answers differently than what you're asking for, that just means Jesus knows more than you do about the situation. And his ways are better. Okay? So... Not that he's a trustworthy theologian, but Garth Brooks was even thankful for unanswered prayers sometimes. And I certainly have been in my life too. Right. So, Ron's saying, okay, it says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. It doesn't say in his will. Um, so, why not just pray for the Corvette in Jesus' name, right? And, and this is where prosperity gospels go to, to this kind of stuff, right? And I'm, I'm trying to think if it's maybe in Psalm 145. Um, Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 37? Okay, let's go there. Which verse? Four. Four, there we go, yep. Okay, Don, do you want to read that? Do it. Okay. Okay. So there you see how if you take a portion of this, pray in Jesus' name, Um, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Clearly, that means I'm getting a Corvette. Right? Clearly, that means 
uh, I'll be able to buy the neighbor's land. Clearly that means whatever it is that's on your mind, right? But I think the same principle applies here. Delight yourself in the Lord, okay? Ask it in Jesus' name. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. This takes a little bit of steps to understand this, but I don't think it's that complicated. What is the mark of a true Christian? To bring glory to God. It's really that simple. So, Vel, if you're overriding desire, and there's, I'm assuming, still some Vel left in Vel, <laughs> okay? But I'm also assuming there's a lot more Christ in Vel than there was 30 years ago, before you were born. Um, that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just missed it. But if your overriding desire as a regenerate Christian is to glorify God, that's what's in your heart. That's the desire of your heart. And God will 100% act in accordance with that. God will 100% of the time act with what will bring Him the most glory. Right? If you knew what God knows, you would pray for exactly what you end up getting. Okay? I'll say that again. If you knew what God knows, you would pray for exactly what you end up getting. Okay? Because if you are a believer, everything you get is for your good. Cancer? Yes. Early death? Yes. A difficult marriage? Yes. It's for your good. And if you knew what God was doing in that, storing up for a weight of eternity, you would ask for exactly that to happen to you. Because God knows something you don't know how he is going to be glorified in that. And that sounds weird. So, so I should pray for colon cancer in my 30s? Well, if you knew what God did, yeah. Yeah, you should. I should pray for my dad to die when I'm a baby? Yeah. If you knew what God knows, yes, you would pray for those things because God is glorified in that. How? I don't know. Delight yourself in the Lord. If you are living for the glory of God, then you will trust that everything he does in your life is for his ultimate glory, and that's exactly what you should pray for. And he will give it to you 100% of the time. Okay? So this isn't a selfish, give me a Corvette, uh, give me this, give me that. This isn't gimme, gimme, gimme. This is living for the glory of God. If your heart desires God to be glorified, you will always, no exceptions, you will always get what you most strongly desire, which is for God to be glorified. In difficulty, in painful things, and in pleasant things. Again, I'll quote Wilson. He says, if you're a believer, the promise in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. That means there's only two events in the life of a believer. Pleasant blessings and hard blessings. That's it. Those are the only two events that can happen in the life of a believer. Hard blessings and pleasant blessings. That's it. It's really, it's that simple. It's that simple. Okay? And that's something to learn when we're not suffering because to learn that when we are suffering is difficult. So learn it when you're not suffering so that when you are suffering, there's a resource to pull on there. We need to learn theology when we feel good so we can draw on it when we don't feel good. But that's what these verses mean, I do believe. And so to go back to John 14, 14, which is really the original text here, if we're asking in Jesus' name, that means we're asking on his behalf. We're asking according to his name. We're asking uh, as ambassadors of Christ. And I'll maybe stop it there. More discussion on that. Can you see, pastorally, I want to leave it on a pastoral note. Does it make sense, can you see it, that if you're a believer, there's only two events in your life? The kind of blessings you want and the kind of blessings you need and are difficult, but it's a blessing? Can you see that? Okay. We're going to have a lot of whippy Christians apart from that. Your pain and your suffering is a gift from God. Okay. And I say that not as someone 
who hasn't suffered. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, Howard shared personally. If if you don't have that, your suffering essentially becomes meaningless, right? There's people have questions when you say, So God wanted you to have that cancer? And we have to say clearly, He didn't stop it. People have theological questions, but think but at least there's questions that have answers. And at least there's a God who's with you in that suffering, accomplishing something. If you can't say that, now the universe is slipping through God's fingers. Things are happening that God does not want to happen. Now, the suffering is still just as real, but now it's absolutely meaningless. It's purposeless. That's frightening. Pastorally, this is life and death. In suffering... Let's close right there. Father God, I want to thank you that you are good. I want to thank you for these discussions. I want to thank you for people's openness to even share about painful things and suffering and the things that you accomplish while we suffer. Lord, and I pray that as we look at these promises in your word, that we would get over ourselves, that we would quit looking inward and that we would start looking outward and grab hold of your word. Trust in your promises that we would dwell in the security of your word. Lord, and even just now as Howard and Grant have shared that you were there in the suffering, Lord, I pray that even when we don't understand what you are accomplishing, I pray that we would be so committed to your word that we know even if we don't see it we know with certainty that you are doing something good lord perhaps you're keeping us from the kind of pride that would do foolish things that would throw our lives away perhaps you are building in us patience and assurance and a deeper trust to go into your word rather than into ourselves lord we do not know And even when we see two or three things, Lord, we don't know the 10 million things that you are doing because of how complex our human relationships are and the way one person's life affects the next. Lord, I pray that we would trust in your wisdom, that we would trust in your kindness, in our suffering and in our joy. Lord, I pray that we would have uh, the kind of faith that is commended in the passages we looked at this morning, that we would ask according to your will, that we would ask according to your name and that we would trust according to your name. Lord, forgive us and forgive me when we think that our plans and our ideas are better than yours. Lord, I pray that we would be patient while you make us wait. I pray that you would grow in us and cultivate in us the kind of godliness and the kind of patience that you are pleased to look at. And I commit this morning into your hands.